Okay, so today we're talking about Gottlob Frege's paper on sense and reference. This was first published in German in 1892, and it's been translated several times. Uh, we are looking here at the translation that appeared in the Philosophical Review in 1948. Uh, I'm actually not sure who did this translation, but there are several other translations out there that use slightly different terminology. So the central conception of this paper is that it's about what is meaning. And he's going to argue that there's at least two different things that we might mean by the meaning of a word or of a sentence. And the idea is that for each of these conceptions of meaning, the meaning of a sentence needs to be derived from the meanings of the parts of the sentence and the way those parts are put together. This is something that Frege never explicitly states, but this principle known as compositionality seems to be central to most of his arguments in this paper. And this principle is very plausible because uh, it's hard to see how we would be able to understand the incredible diversity of new sentences that we hear every single day if there wasn't something like this, some way in which the meaning of a sentence is determined by the meanings of the parts. But he, uh, because of that way that the meaning of a sentence is determined by the meanings of the parts, he's going to say, in addition to the obvious conception of the meaning of a word, the thing that it stands for, that reference, he says there must be some other level of meaning in order to explain how it is that sentences about the same thing could have different meaning. And we'll see that argument uh, in greater detail. Uh, but there's a few other arguments that are important in this paper. One is that the second conception of meaning, this sense, as he's going to say, is something that is not just a subjective thing in the individual speaker's head. It's something that is out there, that is shared, that different speakers of a language can have in common. And his idea of this concept of sense is somehow in this Platonic realm, which is sometimes called a third realm because it's distinct from the material world and the mental world. But he thinks senses are in this third realm, they're common shared property between people, He's arguing at first that the sense is distinct from the object that the word refers to. And then second, he's going to argue that it is distinct from any private conception in one's individual mind. He then goes on to make a few other arguments in particular about what the sense and reference of a sentence are. His idea is that the sense is the meaning of the sentence, the thought expressed by the sentence, the proposition expressed as contemporary philosophers might say. Whereas the referent of a sentence, he's going to say, is the truth value, whether the sentence is true or false. And as I say, he's going to go through several arguments for all of these views. Most of these arguments are in the first half of the paper. The second half of the paper is not nearly as essential for the main points. It just goes on to show how to do this kind of analysis for different grammatical structures within a sentence. So if you only get through the first half of the paper, you've already got most of the point of the paper, but I'll go through the whole thing here. Okay, so let's begin. Sense and Reference by Gottlob Frege. Identity gives rise to challenging questions which are not altogether easy to answer. And he has this footnote, identity. I use this word strictly and understand A equals B or A is B to have the sense of A is the same as B or A and B coincide. That is, he's saying here, when he uses the equal sign, he really means to be saying, these are the same object, not that they are similar to each other, but that they are in fact the same object. And we'll see how that uh, comes up. Okay, so identity. Is it a relation? A relation between objects or between names or signs of objects? He's going to use names or signs interchangeably to stand for whatever the word or word-like thing is that we use to stand for something. Um, so uh, in my Begriffschrift, that's uh, concept writing in German. That's an earlier book that he wrote. So in my Begriffschrift, I assumed the latter. That is, he assumed that identity is a relation between the signs. Uh, he says, the reasons which seem to favor this are the following. A is A and A is B are obviously statements of differing cognitive value. A is A holds a priori and according to Kant is to be labeled analytic. While statements the form A is B 
often contain very valuable extensions of our knowledge and cannot always be established a priori. That is, analytic sentences, those are sentences that can be determined to be true just by thinking of the meanings of the words involved, whereas synthetic sentences, the only way to know whether they're true or false is to actually look at the world. And so uh, here he's saying, here's this argument. The sentence A is A is analytic. The sentence A is B is synthetic. That's a difference in their meaning. Therefore, some component of this sentence must differ in meaning. Since A and B both stand for the same object, uh, the meaning can't be uh, about those objects. And so in his earlier book, he thought the meaning of the sentence is to say the name A and the name B stand for the same object. So when you say A is A or when you say A is B, in his earlier book, he thought that meant you're talking about the names now, you're not talking about the thing itself. As he said, the discovery that the rising sun is not new every morning, but always the same, was a very great consequence to astronomy. Even today, the identification of a small planet or a comet is not always a matter of course. Now, here's his argument against his earlier view. If we were to regard identity as a relation between that which the names A and B designate, uh, it would seem that A equals B could not differ from A equals A, i.e. provided A is B is true. Sorry, that was the argument he did give in the earlier book. If we were to regard identity as a relation between the objects, then since the objects are the same, these two sentences would be saying the same thing. A relation would thereby be expressed of a thing to itself, and indeed one in which each thing stands to itself, but to no other thing. However, what is intended to be said by A equals B seems to be that the signs or names A and B designate the same thing so that those signs themselves would be under discussion. A relation between them would be asserted. So that's the view he had in the earlier book. But this relation would hold between the names or signs only insofar as they named or designated something. It would be mediated by the connection of each of the two signs with the same designated thing. But this is arbitrary. Nobody can be forbidden to use any arbitrarily producible event or object as a sign for something. That is, he's saying here, uh, you're always able to make up a new word. And when he says any arbitrarily producible event or object is a sign for something, that means you don't have to make a name using the sounds of a language. You could uh, uh, figure out how to, uh, if you could say snapping your fingers is a name for something rather than a sound that you make with your lips and tongue. Uh, and then he says, if we're talking about the sign, then in that case, the sentence A is B would no longer refer to the subject matter, but only to its mode of designation. We would express no proper knowledge by, it mean, by its means. But in many cases, this is just what we want to do. That is, he's saying, in his earlier view, when he said this sentence is about the names A and B, uh, well, if the sentence is about the names, then it's not a sentence of astronomy. The sentence that says, the sun that rose today is the same as the sun that rose yesterday would just be a sentence saying, I happen to have chosen to use the phrase, the sun that rose today, and the phrase, the sun that rose yesterday, to refer to the same object. But he's saying, it's not just telling us that, it's actually summarizing a discovery in astronomy we are talking about that thing up there in the sky uh, when we talk about the sun today being the same as the sun yesterday. So if the sign A is distinguished from the sign B only as object, here by means of its shape, not as sign, i.e. not by the manner in which it designates something, then the cognitive value of A as A becomes essentially equal to that of A as B, provided A as B is true. That is, he's saying, if this is just about the names, then all we could be saying is these names refer to the same object. But if the object and the name are the only thing that are relevant, then there's no substantive discovery anywhere in here. There's a statement about having chosen to use two names in the same way, or there's a statement that the thing is itself. He says here, here's his response, his new theory. A difference can arise only if the difference between the signs corresponds to a difference in the mode of presentation of that which is designated. That is, uh, it matters 
that I've actually chosen to use these names differently. And then we can discover that even though I'm using them differently, they happen to refer to the same object. The phrase, the sun that rose today, and the phrase, the sun that rose yesterday, it doesn't, it's not just that they happen to refer to the same object. It's that I know how this one name refers, I know how the other name refers, and then discovering that they refer to the same object is a substantive discovery about the object, not just about how I chose to use the names. So here's another example he gives. Let A, B, C be the lines connecting the vertices of a triangle with the midpoints of the opposite sides. The point of intersection of A and B is then the same as the point of the intersection of B and C. This is a fact that you may have learned in a geometry class at some point, doesn't matter. Greg is a math professor, so he assumes that everyone uh, knows all this stuff. But uh, uh, the point of the example isn't about the geometry. It's that we have different designations for the same point. And these names, point of intersection of A and B, point of intersection of B and C, likewise indicate the mode of presentation. And hence the statement contains true knowledge. Uh, one more comment, he's using the word name uh, to talk about these longer phrases. He's assuming that these phrases work very much like proper names, like Joe or Sally. And uh, there is debate to be had about whether or not that's true, but for now, we'll at least treat it as uh, true. The question is, how? what's the meaning of a phrase that denotes a particular object? Uh, the, the phrase refers to the object, but he claims there's a difference in the mode of presentation of these phrases, and that is what he means by the sense, the mode of presentation. It is natural now to think of their being connected with a sign, name, combinations of words, letter. Besides, that to which the sign refers, which may be called the referent of the sign, also what I would like to call the sense of the sign, wherein the mode of presentation is contained. In our example, accordingly, the reference of the expressions, the point of intersection of A and B and the point of intersection of B and C would be the same, but not their senses. The referent of evening star would be the same as that of morning star, but not the sense. It is clear from the context that by sign and name, I've here understood any designation representing a proper name whose referent is thus a definite object. I think he's using the word definite to mean there is something and it's unique. Uh, this is a word that comes back throughout and someone was asking me about that uh, on the discussion board. So he says, uh, by sign and name, I've understood any designation that represents uh, and whose referent is a definite object. And object, this word is taken in the widest range. It could be the, the word July refers to an object. That object is, this stretch of days that happens once a year, that's a strange sort of object. It's different from the object that is happiness. Happiness is a state that many people might sometimes be in and sometimes not be in, but happiness, July, Kenny, the point of intersection of A and B, the sun, the White House, the evening star, these are all names in his sense. Uh, so he says, uh, he's, considering objects that represent a proper name, which refer to a definite object, but no concept and no relation, which shall be discussed further in another article. And this is his article on concept and object, where he distinguishes what's the meaning of a concept from the meaning of an object. And so uh, is happy is going to be a concept, whereas happiness is an object in his sense. The designation of a single object can also consist of several words or other signs. For brevity, let every such designation be called a proper name. So this is just what I was saying. The sense of a proper name is grasped by everybody who is sufficiently familiar with the language or totality of designations to which it belongs. This is a weird point, so he's coming to a footnote. I think it's quite plausible for some, uh, some of these things, where if I give a phrase with a meaning, like uh, the largest cat in North America, or uh, the computer that is in the back of this room. These might be phrases where anyone who speaks this language knows what the meaning of the phrase is. Uh, 
And then he says, but this serves to illuminate only a single aspect of the record, supposing it to exist. Is there a computer in the back of this room? Is there a largest cat in North America? We don't know anything about those objects, but if you know the language, you know what those phrases mean and how to figure out what that object is. But his footnote, I think, is important here. He says, in the case of an actual proper name, such as Aristotle, opinions as to the sense may differ. That is, this, this name doesn't sort of wear its definition on its sleeve. It might, for instance, be taken to be the following. The pupil of Plato and teacher of Alexander the Great. That's certainly not how I think of the name Aristotle, but someone might think of the name Aristotle that way. Anybody who does this will attach another sense to the sentence, Aristotle was born in Stagira, then will a man who takes as the sense of the name, the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira. So that is someone who thinks was born in Stagira is part of the definition of the name Aristotle would think that this sentence is analytic, whereas someone who thinks the sense of the name, the definition of the name is just student of Plato, teacher of Alexander the Great, they don't think this sentence is analytic. They think this sentence is synthetic. Uh, so long as the referent remains the same, such variations of sense may be tolerated, although they are to be avoided in the theoretical structure of a demonstrative science and ought not to occur in a complete language. Here, Frege is expressing some ideas about how he thinks an ideal language should work. It shouldn't have this sort of subjectivity in the meanings of names. And uh, this is an issue to come back to in thinking, how plausible is this theory really as a theory of all names in language? So he says, comprehensive knowledge of the referent would require us to be able to say immediately whether every given sense belonged to it. To such knowledge, we never attain. That is, when I use a phrase, I know the meaning of that phrase. I might be able to figure out what object that phrase refers to. But even if I can figure out that object, I never know everything about any object. For every object, I only have partial knowledge, whereas I can have full knowledge of the sense, the definition of a phrase. And so that's one more distinction he's giving us between the sense and the reference. The referent is an object in all its complexity. The sense is the definition of a phrase. The sense is something that we have to know in order to know the language. The referent is something that we could figure out if we do some investigation, but we're not going to know everything about it. Okay, so the regular connection between a sign, its sense, and its referent is of such a kind that to the sign, there corresponds a definite sense. That is, for every word, there's a single definition of that word. And to that, in turn, a definite referent. That is, for every definition, there's a single object that satisfies that definition. While to a given referent, an object, there does not belong only a single sign. There can be many ways of referring to the same object. There are many signs that refer to the same object. The same sense has different expressions in different languages. That is, uh, in a different language, the, uh, the word for the largest uh, table in this room is different because that's an English word, but an English phrase for that. We could have a French phrase, uh, la table plus grand, uh, or something. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, the French and English would have the same meaning. So there would be the same sense with different signs in different languages. Uh, the same sense has different expressions in different languages, or even in the same language. Uh, maybe there are synonyms like father and dad. Those could be two words that express the same sense. To be sure, exceptions to this regular behavior occur. That is, sometimes there are words that are ambiguous that have multiple senses. Sometimes there are senses that fail to refer to an object. Uh, to every expression belonging to a complete totality of signs, there should certainly correspond a definite sense. But natural languages often do not satisfy this condition, and one must be content if the same word has the same sense in the same context. That is, he thinks it's OK that there's some ambiguity in our natural languages, as long as every time we use the word, we know which definition we're using. But he thinks an ideal language would never have a single word with two different meanings, like the word bank that exists in English. Bank can refer to a certain kind of financial institution. It can also refer to the side of a river. And 
it's important that in context, you always know which one you mean and your hearers also know which one you mean. Uh, but he thinks in an ideal language that would never happen. It may per perhaps be granted that every grammatically well-formed expression representing a proper name always has a sense. But this is not to say that to the sense there also corresponds a referent. The words, the celestial body most distant from the earth have a sense, but it is very doubtful if they also have a referent. That is, he's thinking, the universe could well be infinite. And if it's infinite, then there is no celestial body that is farthest from the earth. It would be like uh, the phrase, the largest number. There is no largest number. The phrase has a meaning. It's got a definition. You can ask a kid, what's the largest number? And the kid will know what you mean and eventually figure out, oh, wow, yeah, there is no largest number. And that's a neat feature of that uh, uh, phrase. So it has a sense, but probably doesn't have a reference. The expression, the least rapidly convergent series has a sense, but it is known to have no reference since for every given convergent series, another convergent but less rapidly convergent series can be found. If you're familiar with uh, real analysis and mathematics, you could be happy with that example. Otherwise, just think of this as like the largest number. It's again, an expression with a sense, but no reference. In grasping a sense, one is not certainly assured of a reference. If words are used in the ordinary way, one intends to speak of their reference. It can also happen, however, that one wishes to talk about the words themselves or their sense. So here he's giving us another important distinction. Sometimes we use the words one way, sometimes we use the words another way. So this happens, for instance, when the words of another are quoted. One's own words then first designate words of the other speaker, and only the latter have their usual reference. So uh, if I quote a sentence, if I said, Frege said, if words are used in the ordinary way, one intends to speak of their reference. My words don't refer to the things in the world. My words refer to Frege's words. His words refer to the things in the world, but I'm referring to his words. Uh, we then have signs of signs. In writing, the words are, in this case, enclosed in quotation marks. Accordingly, a word standing between quotation marks must not be taken as having its ordinary referent. In order to speak of the sense of an expression A, one may simply use the phrase, the sense of the expression A. In reported speech, one talks about the sense, e.g. of another person's remarks. So I could say, Frege just told us that words don't always refer to the thing itself. And when I said that phrase, that words don't always refer to the thing itself. I am not using those words myself. I'm not talking about the things that they're talking about, but I'm also not quoting Frege. I'm not talking about his words. Instead, I'm saying the sense of what he said. I'm referring to the thought that he expressed. So that is in reported speech, I'm talking about his sense. I'm not talking about the referent, and I'm not talking about the words. I'm talking about this thing in between, the sense. It is quite clear that in this way of speaking, words do not have their customary reference, but designate what is usually their sense. In order to have a short expression, we will say, in reported speech, words are used indirectly or have their indirect reference. That is, reported speech means either direct quotation or paraphrase. We distinguish Accordingly, the customary from the indirect referent a word and its customary sense from its indirect sense. The indirect referent of a word is accordingly its customary sense. That is, uh, when I am saying what Frege said, when I'm saying what someone else said, I am not referring to, I'm not using a word to refer to its customary referent. I'm using the word to refer to its customary sense because the sense of that word is what was said by this person. So he says such exceptions, this, the fact that words sometimes refer indirectly, must always be borne in mind if the mode of connection between sign, sense, and a referent in particular cases is to be correctly understood. That is, usually I use the word, the sign, to refer using its ordinary sense to refer to a particular object but at least sometimes I am referring to the sense of that basic sense, uh, use, not the reference. 
If the referent of a sign is an object perceivable by the senses, my conception of it is an internal image. And here he's discussing something that is different from the sense, the referent, or any of the other things he's mentioned. He is saying my conception of it is an internal image. And we can include with the conceptions the direct experiences in which sense, exp sense impressions and activities themselves take the place of the traces which they have left in the mind. The distinction is unimportant for our purpose, especially since memories of sense impressions and activities always help to complete the conceptual image. One can also understand direct experience as including any object insofar as it is sensibly perceptible or spatial. So that is when he's talking about an image, he's talking about whatever sensations and experiences you might either have or associate with a name. So that is if the referent of a sign is an object perceivable by the senses, my conception is the internal image arising from the memories of sense impressions which I have had and activities both internal and external which I've performed. That is, some words might have associations with sensations, some words might have associations with activities. There's all sorts of things going on in my head when I think of a word. Such a conception is often saturated with feeling. The clarity of its separate parts varies and oscillates. The same sense is not always connected, even in the same man with the same conception. This conception is subjective. One man's conception is not that of another. That is, each of us has our own conceptions. The conceptions or ideas change from day to day, from moment to moment. And there result, as a matter of course, a variety of differences in the conceptions associated with the same sense. A painter, a horseman, and a zoologist will probably connect different conceptions with the name Bucephalus. Bucephalus happens to be the name of Alexander the Great's horse. I'm not sure why he was so into Alexander the Great examples here, but Bucephalus was Alexander the Great's horse. And in Greek, the word Bucephalus means cow head. So I assume Alexander the Great's horse had a head that was shaped sort of like the head of a cow. And so uh, a zoologist is going to have some idea of what that name means. A horseman, someone who rides lots of horses, is going to have another idea of that horse and may in fact know stories about Alexander the Great's horse. A painter is going to have another sort of conception because there may be some famous paintings of Alexander the Great with his horse. And perhaps the painter associates the image of that painting. The horseman associates the feeling of certain exploits that are attributed to Alexander of his horse. And a zoologist might attribute the idea of a horse whose head is shaped like a cow's head. And so he says, this constitutes an essential distinction between the conception the, the personal subjective thing, and the sign's sense, which may be the common property of many, and therefore is not a part or a mode of the individual mind. For one can hardly deny that mankind has a common store of thoughts, which is transmitted from one generation to another. Hence, it is inadvisable to use the word conception to designate something so basically different. This last point, I think, is a very controversial one. He's claiming, yes, we can all think the same thoughts, and these thoughts can be transmitted from one person to another. And because we can think the same thoughts, those thoughts must be composed of something that he thinks is the meaning of the words, which is distinct from anything going on in my head or your head. It's this separate abstract thing, this meaning. So this is his second major argument here. The first argument was, in addition to the reference and the name, there's a sense. And then this one is saying, the sense is not a personal subjective thing. The sense is a public shared thing, which must therefore be abstract. In light of this, one need have no scruples in speaking simply of the sense. Whereas in the case of a conception, one must precisely indicate to whom it belongs and at what time. It might perhaps be said, just as one man connects this conception and another that conception with the same word, so also one man can associate this sense in another that sense. But there still remains a difference in the mode of connection. They are not prevented from grasping the same sense. However, they cannot have the same conception. Si duo idem faciunt non est idem. That Latin means, if two the same do, not is the same. That is, if two people do the same thing, they're not really doing the same thing. What that Latin phrase means is something like, if I comb my hair and you comb your hair, 
there's some sense in which we're doing the same thing, but we're obviously doing something very different also because I'm combing my hair and you're combing your hair. Similarly with these conceptions, even if you and I have a very similar image going on in our head when we hear the same word, it's still my image versus your image. The image is a private thing. And he says, even if we might use, have different senses for a word, if we think of the word as having different definitions, and that happens all the time, especially if you're thinking of people from different generations or people from different countries, or when you're talking about a proper name like Aristotle, uh, we might associate with it different definitions, but this definition, this sense, he thinks is something that we could share in principle, whereas the conception is something we couldn't. So this is another way of suggesting that the sense is different from this personal mental image. If two persons conceive the same, each still has his own conception. It is indeed sometimes possible to establish differences in the conceptions or even in the sensations of different men, but an exact comparison is not possible because we cannot have both conceptions together in the same consciousness. You may have wondered whether at some point in your life, whether your sensation of the color green is the same as someone else's sensation of the color green. And we'll never know that answer because if I were able to get your sensation into my head, I'd never be sure that it is your sensation rather than my own version of it. And so these conceptions, these sensations, these can never be compared, but the senses he think can. The referent of a proper name is the object itself, which we designate by its means. The conception, which we thereby have is wholly subjective. In between lies the sense, which is indeed no longer subjective like the conception, but is yet not the object itself. The following analogy will perhaps clarify these relationships. And I think this analogy is a pretty helpful one. Somebody observes the moon through a telescope. I compare the moon itself to the referent. It is the object of the observation, mediated by the real image projected by the object glass in the interior of the telescope and by the retinal image of the observer. The former, that is the image in the lens of the telescope, I compare to the sense. The latter, that is the image in your eye, to the conception or experience. The optical image in the telescope is indeed one-sided and dependent on the standpoint of observation but it is still objective in as much as it can be used by several observers. At any rate, it could be arranged for several to use it simultaneously. That is, if I set up a telescope uh, on campus, we could all stand around the telescope and take turns looking through it and see the same image. The image in the telescope would be the same and is this pu uh, publicly shareable thing. But each of us would have his own retinal image. On account of the diverse shapes of the observer's eyes, even a geometrical congruence could hardly be achieved, and a true coincidence would be out of the question. This analogy might be developed still further by assuming A's retinal image made visible to B, or A might also see his own retinal image in a mirror. In this way, we might perhaps show how a conception can itself be taken as an object, but as such, it is not for the observer what it directly is for the person having the conception. That is, he's saying, I can talk about the idea in your head, you can talk about the idea in your head, but as long as you're talking about it as an idea, that is different from experiencing it. And so there's a difference between the object, the sense, which is this public thing, anyone's idea of it, which is this private, temporary, subjective thing. And that's true even when the object we're talking about is a mental idea. Mental ideas can be objects, but still we refer to them by means of senses, and we have our own ideas about those ideas. But to pursue this would take us too far afield. Okay, we can now recognize three levels of difference between words, expressions, or whole sentences. The difference may occur, may concern at most the conceptions, or it may concern the sense, but not the referent, or finally the referent as well. With respect to the first level, it is to be noted that on account of the uncertain of connection of conceptions with words, a difference may hold for one person which another does not find. That is, I might think two words have a very different sort of association, even if they have the same def definition, whereas you might find those two words to be basically the same. 
So he says, the difference between a translation and the original text should properly not overstep the first level. We're never going to be able to get a translation that exactly matches all of the associations and ideas that go on in anyone's head, because even the same person reading the same words twice isn't going to have a perfect match of those ideas. But if you're translating from one language to another, you might be able to match the senses. That's his idea. To the possible differences here in conception belong also the coloring and shading which poetic eloquence seeks to give to the sense. Such coloring and shading are not objective and must be evoked by each hearer or reader according to the hints of the poet or the speaker. Without some affinity in human conceptions, art would certainly be impossible but it can never be exactly determined how far the intentions of the poet are realized. So that is, he's saying, this is why poetry is so hard to translate, because poetry concerns these personal conceptions that are constantly changing and constantly uh, different for different people. Whereas something like an instruction manual for, a, uh, for an electronic device, that instruction manual, you might think what's important there is the senses and presumably also the objects that it refers to. But the senses are what's important for understanding the meaning of that translation manual. And some document writer in an office somewhere can do that translation, even if they never encounter the object. Someone should be able to write an effective translation of an instruction manual if they match the senses, even if they don't get the personal associations and conceptions the same, and even if they don't ever engage with the objects in themselves. Though, if they've got the senses right, they should be referring to the same objects. In what follows, there will be no further discussion of conceptions and experiences. They have been mentioned here only to ensure that the conception aroused in the hearer by a word shall not be confused with its sense or its referent. So that is, now he's only going to be talking about the objective parts of the meaning. The objectively shared definition or sense, which can be known by the speaker of a language, and the objectively public object, which none of us can ever know in its full details. To make short and exact expressions possible, let the following phraseology be established. A proper name, that is a word, sign, sign combination expression, expresses its sense and refers to or designates its referent. By means of a sign, we express its sense and designate its referent. Idealists or skeptics Idealists are people who believe there are no objects in the world, all there are are ideas in the mind. Skeptics are people who don't think we can know anything about what the world is actually like. They think we might all be in the matrix for all we know. Idealists or skeptics will perhaps long since have objected. You talk without further ado of the moon as an object, but how do you know that the name the moon has any reference? How do you know that anything whatsoever has a reference? I reply that when we say the moon, we do not intend to speak of our conception of the moon, nor are we satisfied with the sense alone, but we presuppose a referent. To assume that in the sentence, the moon is smaller than the earth, the conception of the moon is in question would be flatly to misunderstand the sense. If this is what the speaker wanted, he would use the phrase, my conception of the moon. Now we can of course be mistaken in the presupposition that the moon exists. And such mistakes have indeed occurred. But the question whether the presupposition is perhaps always mistaken need not be answered here. In order to justify mention of the referent of a sign, it is enough at first to point out our intention in speaking or thinking. We must then add the reservation, provided such a referent exists. So that is his point. Uh, someone might say, how do you know that there is such a thing as the referent of any uh, word? And he says, well, we never really know for sure, but that's okay. The point is that when we're talking, we are trying to talk about the referent. And if we discovered that the referent didn't exist, we would all agree that something had gone wrong with our talking. And so the referent, the object itself must be some important level of meaning that we care about. It's not just about the conceptions in our head. It's not just about the senses. Okay, so far we have considered the sense and reference only of such expressions, words, or signs as we have called proper names. We now inquire concerning the sense and reference of an entire declarative sentence. Such a sentence contains a thought. 
And by a thought, I understand not the subjective performance of thinking, but its objective content, which is capable of being the common property of several thinkers. So here his use of the word thought is confusing because thought sounds like a subjective idea in your head, but contemporary philosophers mainly use the word proposition to refer to this thing that multiple people can all understand and, and can be expressed in multiple languages. So is this thought now, this proposition, to be regarded as the sense or the referent of a sentence? Let us assume for the time being that the sentence has a referent. If we now replace one word of the sentence by another having the same referent, but a different sense, this can have no influence upon the referent of the sentence. So here he's assuming this principle of compositionality. If you replace one word with another that has the same referent, then the referent of the sentence should stay the same. If you replace one word with another having the same sense, then the sense of the sentence should be the same. If you replace uh, a word in a sentence with one having a different sense, then the sense of the sentence will change. If you replace a word in a sentence with one having a different referent, then the referent of the sentence might change. So here he says, Let's replace one word by another having the same referent, but a different sense. We can see that in such a case, the thought changes. Since e.g. the thought of the sentence, the morning star is a body illuminated by the sun, differs from that of the sentence, the evening star is a body illuminated by the sun. Anybody who did not know that the evening star is the morning star might hold the one thought to be true and the other false. The thought, accordingly, cannot be the referent of the sentence, but must be considered rather as the sense. What is the position now with regard to the referent? Have we a right even to inquire about it? Is it possible that a sentence as a whole only has a sense but no referent? At any rate, one might expect that such sentences occur, just as there are parts of sentences having sense but no referent. And sentences which contain proper names without referent will be of this kind. So here he's giving us an argument as to what he thinks the referent of a sentence is. He says the sentence, Odysseus was set ashore at Ithaca while sound asleep, obviously has a sense. It's a meaningful sentence. It, has a th it expresses a thought. But since it is doubtful whether the name Odysseus occurring therein has a referent, he's doubting whether or not there is such a person as Odysseus described in the Odyssey. It's also doubtful whether the whole sentence has one. Yet it is certain, nevertheless, that anyone who seriously took the sentence to be true or false would ascribe the name to the name Odysseus a referent, not merely a sense, for it is the referent of the name which is held to be or not to be characterized by the predicate. So that is, here he's saying, anyone who thinks that the name Odysseus refers to some actual person is going to think this sentence is true or this sentence is false. Conversely, anyone who thinks this sentence is true and also anyone who thinks the sentence is false would also think that the name Odysseus refers to someone. If you, think this, if, if you don't think Odysseus existed, then you think this sentence isn't really true or false. So he says, yet it is certain nevertheless that anyone who seriously took the sentence to be true or false would describe to the name Odysseus a referent, not merely a sense, for it is the referent of the name which is held to be or to not be characterized by the predicate. Whoever does not consider the referent to exist can neither apply nor withhold the predicate. But in that case, it would be superfluous to advance to the referent of the name. One could be satisfied with the sense if one wanted to go no further than the thought. If it were a question only of the sense of the sentence, the thought, it would be unnecessary to bother with the referent of a part of the sentence. Only the sense, not the referent of the part, is relevant to the sense of the whole sentence. The thought remains the same, whether Odysseus has a referent or not. The fact that we concern ourselves at all about the referent of a part of the sentence indicates that we generally recognize and expect a referent for the sentence itself. So that's his argument. The fact that we sometimes care about the referent of a word indicates that we sometimes care about the referent of a sentence because the sense of a sentence only depends on the sense of the words. The only thing that depends on the referent of the word is the referent of the sentence. So if we assume this version of compositionality, then we must say there is both a sense and a referent of a sentence. 
the sense of the sentence is the thought expressed. And then he says, uh, the fact that we care about the referent of a part of the sentence indicates that we recognize and expect a referent for the sentence itself. The thought loses value for us as soon as we recognize that the referent of one of its parts is meaning, is missing. We are therefore justified in not being satisfied with the sense of a sentence and inquiring also as to its referent. But now, why do we want every proper name to have not only a sense, but also a referent? Why is the thought not enough for us? Because, and to the extent that, we are concerned with its truth value. This is not always the case. In hearing an epic poem, for instance, apart from the euphony of the language, how, how this poem sounds, we're interested only in the sense of the sentences and the images and feelings thereby aroused. The question of truth would cause us to abandon aesthetic delight for an attitude of scientific investigation. Hence, it is a matter of indifference to us whether the name Odysseus, for instance, has a referent, so long as we accept the poem as a work of art. It is the striving for truth that drives us always to advance from the sense to its referent. We have seen that the referent of sentence may always be sought whenever the referents of its components are involved, and that this is the case when and only when we are inquiring after the truth value. We are therefore driven into accepting the truth value of a sentence as its referent. So that's his argument. The, uh, the thought expressed by a sentence is its sense. That's what's built up of the senses of the words. The truth value of a sentence, whether it's true or false, that is the referent, and that is built up by the objects involved. And now this footnote six, it would be desirable to have a special term for signs having only sense. If we name them, say, representations, the words of the actors on the stage would be representations. Indeed, the actor himself would be a representation. I think there's a lot in that thought that he doesn't really go into, but the idea is that some names don't refer to an actual thing, they just express a sense, and those are these representations he's talking about. And he thinks certain words are like that, even though most words are meant to have a referent. So we are thereby driven into accepting the truth value of a sentence as its referent. By the truth value of a sentence, I understand the circumstance that it is true or false. There are no further truth values. For brevity, I call the one the true, the other the false. Every declarative sentence concerned with the reference of its words is therefore to be regarded as a proper name, and its referent, if it exists, is either the true or the false. These two objects are recognized, if only implicitly, by everybody who judges something to be true, and so even by a skeptic. The designation of the truth values as objects may appear to be an arbitrary fancy or perhaps a mere play upon words from which no profound consequences could be drawn. What I mean by an object can be more exactly discussed only in connection with concept and relation. I will reserve this for another article, and here he's mentioning again that article on concept and object. But so much should already be clear that in every judgment, no matter how trivial, the step from the level of thoughts to the level of reference, the objective, has already been taken. And footnote seven, a judgment for me is not the mere comprehension of a thought, but the recognition of its truth. So that is, there's a thought. It's really cold out today. I currently judge that thought to be true. On a different occasion, I might judge that thought to be false. Or if I were uh, locked away somewhere, uh, isolated from the weather, I might not judge that proposition, either true or false. I might just consider it, imagine it. The judgment is the act of thinking that thought is true or thinking that thought is false. One might be tempted to regard the relation of the thought to the true, not as that of the sense to the referent, but rather as that of subject to predicate. One can indeed say, the thought that five is a prime number is true. But closer examination shows that nothing more has been said than in the simple sentence, five is a prime number. The truth claim arises in each case from the form of the declarative sentence. And when the latter lacks its usual force, e.g. in the mouth of an actor upon the stage. Even the sentence, the thought that five is a prime number is true, 
contains only a thought, and indeed the same thought as the symbol five is a prime number. It follows that the relation of the thought to the true may not be compared with that of subject to predicate. Subject and predicate understood in the logical sense are indeed elements of thought. They stand on the same level for knowledge. By combining subject and predicate, one reaches only a thought, never passes from a sense to its referent, never from a thought to its truth value. One moves at the same level, but never advances from one level to the next. A truth value cannot be a part of a thought any more than, say, the sun can, for it is not a sense, but an object. I think this is a very confusing passage. He's mainly just saying thoughts are made up of senses. And when you judge something to be true, you are not just imagining some further thought. You are, in fact, th thinking it true. Truth is a further thing beyond the meaning of the thought, whereas imagination or mere consideration, that's something you can do with the thought. And if you just imagine that a sentence is true, you're not imagining anything different than just imagining the sentence itself. And so that's why he says this proceeding to truth is not just having another thought. It's, an, it's a specific way of thinking that thought, thinking it true as opposed to just imagining it. If our supposition that the referent of a sentence is its truth value is correct, then the latter must remain unchanged when a part of the sentence is replaced by an expression having the same referent. And this is in fact the case. Leibniz explains, eadem sunt quae sibi mutuo substitui possunt salva veritate. Equal are those which for each other mutually substituted can be saving the truth. That is, uh, Leibniz says, what it is to say that two objects are the same object is in fact to say any sentence about one would also be true if it's about the other. And that's why even if we both drive the same car, maybe you and I both have a 2010 Prius, we don't have the same car unless it's literally the same token individual. And if it is literally the same token individual, then anything you say about one would also be true if you said it about the other, because the other is the one. If it's possible to say something about one object and say the same thing about a different object, and one of those be true and the other false, then those objects are not the same object. And so that's what he means. Uh, if you substitute two names that refer to the same object, the sentence will still be true. Whereas if you set, substitute a name that refers to a different object, the sentence might still be true if the two objects happen to be similar in that way, but it might be false. What else but the truth value could be found that belongs quite generally to every sentence concerned with the reference of its components and remains unchanged by substitutions of the kind in question? Okay. If now the truth value of a sentence is its referent, then on the one hand, all true sentences have the same referent, and so on the other hand, do all false sentences. From this, we see that in the referent of the sentence, all that is specific is obliterated. We can never be concerned only with the referent of a sentence. But again, the mere thought alone yields no knowledge, but only the thought together with its referent, i.e. its truth value. Judgments, can be regarded as advances from a thought to a truth value. Naturally, this cannot be a definition. Judgment is something quite peculiar and incomparable. One might also say that judgments are distinctions of parts within truth values. Such distinction occurs by a return to the thought. To every sense belonging to a truth value, there would correspond its own manner of analysis. However, I've here used the word part in a special sense. I have in, tran in fact transferred the relation between the parts and whole of a sentence to its referent by calling the referent of a word part of the referent of the sentence, if the word itself is a part of the sentence. That is, we're saying, if fire is hot and snow is white are both true sentences, then the object fire is somehow part of the true, and the object snow is also somehow part of the true. Some people might say that if we think of the true as just the world itself. What is the world? That is what is true. And each of these sentences 
is about part of it. Uh, but he says, this is really probably more of a metaphor. It's rather that there are two thoughts, the thought that fire is hot and the thought that snow is white. And these thoughts have senses of the word fire and sense of the word snow as parts of those thoughts. And these thoughts are both, in fact, true thoughts. So therefore, somehow, these concepts or senses are parts of true thoughts. I don't know. This way of speaking can certainly be attacked because in the case of a referent, the whole and one part do not suffice to determine the remainder. And because the word part is already used in another sense of bodies, a special term would need to be invented. So yeah, don't worry too much about that part. Uh, he's suggesting that it's confusing anyway. The supposition that the truth value of a sentence is its referent shall now be put to further test. We have found that the truth value of a sentence remains unchanged when an expression is replaced by another having the same referent. But if we have not yet considered the case in which the expression to be replaced is itself a sentence. Now, if our view is correct, the truth value of a sentence containing another as part must remain unchanged when the part is replaced by another sentence having the same truth value. Exceptions are to be expected when the whole sentence or its part is direct or indirect quotation. For in such cases, as we have seen, the words do not have their customary reference. In direct quotation, a sentence designates another sentence and in indirect quotation, a thought. So I think from here to the end of the paper, he's doing a lot more technical analysis of grammatical structures of sentences. And if you don't follow any of the rest of this paper, it's probably okay. It's fine to just deal with the part so far. But I think going through the rest of this will help clarify some of the ideas that he had at the beginning about direct and indirect reference and uh, the different roles that these different conceptions of meaning play in complex sentences. And as you'll see, it ends up meaning that uh, grammar has to be quite complex in order to indicate when words are being used with their usual referent and when words are being used to refer to their usual sense. And so here, we are thus led to consider subordinate sentences or clauses. These occur as parts of a sentence structure, which is, from the logical standpoint, likewise a sentence. But here we meet the question whether it is also true of the subordinate sentence that it's referent as a truth value. Of indirect quotation, we already know the opposite. That is, in the sentence, uh, John said that Mary is tall. I'm not saying anything about Mary. I'm saying something about what John said. Mary may not even exist. As far as I'm concerned, what I'm referring to is John said that Mary is tall. The word John refers to a person, whereas the word Mary refers to the sense of the name Mary. I am saying, what did John say? Uh, subordinate clauses, uh, well, we'll see what these are when we get to the examples. Grammarians view subordinate clauses as representatives of parts of sentences and divide them accordingly into noun clauses, adjective clauses, adverbial clauses. That is, some sub subordinate sentences take the place of a noun. When I said, John said, Mary, that Mary is tall, that Mary is tall takes the place of a noun. It's what John said. I could say, John said the Pledge of Allegiance and put a noun in there, the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, <coughs> but clauses can also play other grammatical roles. So this might generate the supposition that the referent of a subordinate clause was not a truth value, but rather of the same kind as the referent of a noun or adjective or adverb. In short, of a part of a sentence, whose sense was not a thought, but only a part of a thought. Only a more thorough investigation can clarify the issue. In so doing, we shall not follow the grammatical category strictly, but rather group together what is logically of the same kind. Let us first search for cases in which the sense of the subordinate clause, as we have just supposed, is not an independent thought. So first, his, his first main innovation here is to say, don't look at the grammatical structure to figure out uh, what is the logical meaning of a sentence. Look at the logical structure. And he says, many different grammatical structures for these different clauses have different logical types of meaning. 
So the case of an abstract noun clause introduced by that, like that Mary is tall. This includes the case of indirect quotation in which we have seen the words to have their indirect reference coinciding with what is customarily their sense. In this case then, the subordinate clause has for its referent a thought, not a truth value, as its sense, not a thought, <coughs> but the sense of the words, the thought that, which is only a part of the thought of the entire complex sentence. So for instance, I might say, John said that Mary is tall. And I might say, Sam said the same thing as John. In this case, that Mary is tall and the same thing as John are two phrases that both refer to the same object, that ob object being a proposition or thought, namely the thought that Mary is tall. And so they are different phrases with the same referent. So they must express different senses. So that is one of them refers to the thought that Mary is tall as the thought that Mary is tall. The other one refers to the thought that Mary is tall as the thing that John said. And so they're referring to the same object in different ways. They are two phrases with the same referent and different senses. So uh, this happens after say, hear, be of the opinion, be convinced, conclude, and similar words. And then he says in his footnote, in the sentence, A lied in saying that he had seen B, the subordinate clause designates a thought which is said first to have been asserted by A, Two, while A was convinced of its falsity. So he's saying, in this case, we just are referring to a thought, but sometimes we're saying multiple things about it by means of the verb that's used. Otherwise, and indeed somewhat complicated, is the situation after words like perceive, know, fancy, which are to be considered later. These are words that I think uh, linguists will say are factive. In cases of the first kind, the referent of the subordinate clause is in fact, or that in the cases of the first kind, the referent of the subordinate clause is in fact the thought, can also be recognized by seeing that it is indifferent to the truth of the whole, whether the subordinate clause is true or false. Let us compare, for instance, the two sentences, Copernicus believed that the planetary orbits are circles, and Copernicus believed that the apparent motion of the sun is produced by the real motion of the earth. One subordinate clause can be substituted for the other without harm to the truth. That is, it is in fact true that Copernicus believed both of these things, even though one of these things he believed, that the planetary orbits are circles. This is false. They're actually more like ellipses. This other thing he believed, that the apparent motion of the sun is produced by the real motion of the earth, that's true. So the fact that one sentence is true and the other is false, even though we've put a uh, no, both sentences are true, even though we've substituted a true part for a false part, indicates that the truth value of the sentence as a whole doesn't depend on the truth value of this part. Instead, it depends on the thought expressed by this part. And that's his argument that these indir indirect clauses refer to their standard senses, because it's when they stand for some different sense, it's the sense that plays the role in determining whether the sentence as a whole is true or false. The main clause and the subordinate clause together have as their sense only a single thought. And the truth of the whole includes neither the truth nor the untruth of the subordinate clause. When you say Copernicus believed that X, you're not saying whether X is true or false. You're just saying something about what Copernicus believed. In such cases, it is not permissible to replace one expression in the subordinate clause by another having the same customary referent, but only by one having the same indirect referent, i.e. the same customary sense. If somebody were to conclude the referent of a sentence is not its truth value, for then it could always be replaced by another sentence of the same truth value, he would prove too much. One might just as well claim that the referent of morning star is not Venus, since one may not always say Venus in place of morning star. That is, uh, I might say, Copernicus believed that the morning star was a planet. Copernicus didn't believe that Venus was a planet. Those probably aren't true examples, but the fact that we could imagine a case where someone believes that. So maybe a good example is Lois Lane believes that Superman can fly. 
Lois Lane doesn't believe that Clark Kent can fly. Uh, or maybe better yet, consider the two sentences. Lois Lane believes that Superman can fly. Lois Lane believes that Clark Kent can fly. One of those sentences is true. The other is false. The names refer to the same object. You would have thought that meant that the sentence involving them must have the same truth value. But he's saying, in this context, when it's within the believes that operator, these names no longer refer to their usual referent. They instead refer to their sense. And so he says, uh, there must be some context in which words refer to their sense, because in those contexts, you can't substitute words referring to the same object and get the same truth value. But if you're not in that sort of context, if you're in a context where a word refers ordinarily, then you can substitute words referring to the same object and get the same truth value. So one has the right to conclude only that the referent of a sentence is not always its truth value, and that morning star does not always refer to the planet Venus, namely when the word has its indirect referent. An exception of such a kind occurs in the subordinate clause just considered whose reference or thoughts. So here he says, he starts with this idea, there's a difference between the sense and the referent of a word. And then now he's showing how that theory has to accommodate various complex grammatical structures. When you've got a subordinate clause, sometimes you can no longer substitute one word for another with the same referent. Instead, you have to substitute one word for another of the same sense. And so that's how you can tell when a that a subordinate clause like that is indirect in this, in this way. So that is, if one says, it seems that, one means it seems to me that, or I think that, we therefore have the same case again. The situation is similar in the case of expressions such as to be pleased, to regret, to approve, to blame, to hope, to fear. If, toward the end of the Battle of Waterloo, Wellington was glad that the Prussians were coming, the basis for his joy was a conviction. That is, if Wellington was glad that the Prussians were coming, that doesn't mean that the Prussians were coming. It just means there's a thought that made Wellington glad. Had he been deceived, he would have been no less pleased so long as his illusion lasted. And before he became convinced that the Prussians were coming, he would not have been pleased, even if they were. That is, before he became so convinced, he could not have been pleased that the Prussians were coming, even though, in fact, they might have already been approaching. Just as a conviction or a belief is the ground of a feeling, it can, as an inference, also be the ground of a conviction. So that is, one belief can ground another belief, just as one belief can ground a feeling. In the sentence, Columbus inferred from the roundness of the earth that he could reach India by traveling towards the west. We have as reference to the parts, two thoughts, that the earth is round and that Columbus by traveling to the west could reach India. All that is relevant here is that Columbus was convinced of both and that the one conviction was a ground for the other. Whether the earth really is round and whether Columbus could really reach India by traveling to the west are immaterial to the truth of our sentence. But it is not immaterial whether we replace the earth by the planet which is accompanied by a moon whose diameter is greater than the fourth part of its own. Here also we have the indirect reference to the words. That is, if, Columbi if Columbus didn't know that the earth is the planet which is accompanied by a moon whose diameter is greater than the fourth part of its own, then we would be representing Columbus's thoughts wrong if instead of the earth, we used this phrase. What Columbus thinks is that the earth is round and that he can reach India by going west. And he thinks the latter because he thinks the former. We don't have to think either or both of those thoughts. We don't have to think there's a logical connection between them in order to correctly know what he thought. And this sentence is only about what he thought. This sentence does not say that there is in fact a link between these words. It just says Columbus thought there was. There may be such a link, but the sentence doesn't say. Adverbial clauses of purpose beginning with in order to also belong here. For obviously the purpose is a thought. Therefore, indirect reference to the words, subjunctive mood. Subjunctive mood is something that if you've studied another language, you probably uh, are more familiar with. In English, we almost don't use the subjunctive mood at all. It's just in the sentence, if I were something rather than if I was something. 
and actually modern English speakers often use if I was for the subjunctive, and so they don't distinguish the grammatical form either. But a subordinate clause with that after command, ask, forbid would appear in direct speech as an imperative. Such a clause has no referent, but only a sense. A command, a request are indeed not thoughts, yet they stand on the same level as thoughts. Hence, in subordinate clauses depending upon command, ask, etc., words have their indirect reference. The referent of such a clause is therefore not a truth value, but a command, a request, and so forth. So this is uh, very opaque if we don't consider an example, but if the officer commanded that the troops retreat, what the officer commanded, he might have said, retreat. And the word retreat expresses a thought. It tells people to do something. It is not itself true or false. Retreat is not true or false. The, the officer commanded that the troops retreat. This sentence doesn't say whether or not the troops did or did not retreat. All it says is what the commander commanded. So it doesn't even say that the troops exist. If the officer commanded that the troops retreat, we could imagine some officer who's, maybe it's Napoleon in prison hallucinating that there are troops and he's commanding that they retreat. All we've said in this sentence, the officer commanded that the troops retreat, we've referred to this thought that the troops retreat. And so this, he says, is another indirect reference. The case is similar for the dependent question in phrases such as doubt whether, not know what. It's easy to see that here also the words are to be taken to have their indirect reference. Dependent clauses expressing questions and beginning with who, what, where, when, how, by what means, etc., seem at times to approximate very closely to adverbial clauses in which words have their customary reference. These cases are distinguished linguistically by the mood of the verb. In the case of the subjunctive, we have a dependent question and, indir and indirect reference of the words so that a proper name cannot in general be replaced by another name or the same object. Um, I am not sure exactly what's going on in this paragraph. In the cases so far considered, the words of the subordinate clauses had their indirect reference, and this made it clear that the referent of the subordinate clause itself was indirect, i.e. not a truth value, but a thought, a command, a request, a question. The subordinate clause could be regarded as a noun. Indeed, one could say, as a proper name of that thought, that command, etc., which it represented in the context of the sentence structure. We now come to other subordinate clauses in which the words do have their customary reference, without, however, a thought occurring as sense and a truth value is referent. How this is possible is best made clear by examples. He who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary objects, of the planetary orbits, died in misery. If the sense of the subordinate clause were here a thought, it would have to be possible to express it also in a separate sentence. He who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary objects. But this does not work because the grammatical subject he has no independent sense and only mediates the relations with the consequent clause died in misery. For this reason, the sense of the subordinate clause is not a complete thought. Its referent is Kepler, not a truth value. He who, who, he who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary objects. This is a phrase that refers to Kepler. Uh, one might object that the sense of the whole does contain a thought as part namely that there was somebody who first discovered the elliptic form of the planetary objects. For whoever takes the whole to be true cannot deny this part. This is undoubtedly so, but only because otherwise the subordinate clause, he who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits would have no reference. If anything is asserted, there is always an obvious presupposition that the simple or compound proper names used have reference. If one therefore asserts Kepler died in misery, there is a presupposition that the name Kepler designates something, but it does not follow that the sense of the sentence, Kepler died in misery, contains the thought that the name Kepler designates something. If this were the case, the negation would have to run not, Kepler did not die in misery, but Kepler did not die in misery or the name Kepler has no reference. So here he's objecting to an idea that Bertrand Russell defended later that a sentence says that the terms in it exist. He said, if that were the case, then negating a sentence 
would be, there would be two ways to negate a sentence. You could say either the thing exists and it doesn't have the property or the thing doesn't exist. But he says, when we negate a sentence, we don't say that. Instead, we still assume that the thing exists and are just saying the opposite about it. This assumption is a presupposition. It's not asserted. <clears throat> that the name Kepler designates something is just as much a presupposition for the assertion Kepler died in misery as for the contrary assertion. Now, languages have the fault of containing expressions which fail to designate an object, although the grammatical form seems to qualify them for that purpose, because the truth of some sentences is a prerequisite. Thus, it depends on the truth of the sentence, there was someone who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits, whether the subordinate clause, he who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits, really designates an object or only seems to do so while having, in fact, no reference. And thus, it may appear as if our subordinate clause contains as a part of its sense the thought that there was somebody who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits. If this were right, the negation would run, either he who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits did not die in misery, or there was nobody who discovered the elliptic form of the planetary orbits. This arises from an incompleteness of language, from which even the symbolic language of mathematical analysis is not altogether free. Even there, combinations of symbols can occur, which appear to refer to something having, at any rate so far, no reference, e.g. divergent infinite series. This can be avoided, e.g., by means of a special stipulation that divergent infinite series shall refer to the number zero. So here he's saying, uh, this is not just a fault of nat natural language for having names that don't refer. Even mathematical language has names that don't refer. We could imagine fixing that by saying, by making some weird definition that any mathematical name that doesn't refer refers to the number zero. And he says any logically complete language like his begriff script in his earlier book should satisfy the conditions that every expression grammatically well constructed as a proper name out of signs already introduced shall in fact designate an object and that no new sign shall be introduced as a proper name without having a referent assured. The logic books contain warnings against logical mistakes arising from the ambiguity of expressions. Ambiguity meaning one expression that could refer to multiple things. I regard as no less pertinent a warning against apparent proper names having no reference. The history of mathematics supplies errors which have arisen in this way. This lends itself to demagogic abuse as easily as ambiguity, perhaps even more easily. The phrase, the will of the people can serve as an example for it is easy to establish that there is at any rate no generally accepted referent for this expression. That is, he thinks, uh, he thinks a lot of political errors arise because people use phrases that don't refer to anything like the will of the people. If there is such a thing as the will of the people, maybe what you're saying about it is fine, but why should we think that there is such a thing? And he thinks that's an important logical error to watch out for in natural languages and also in our mathematical languages. It is therefore by no means unimportant to eliminate the source of these mistakes, at least in science, once and for all. Then such objections as the one discussed above would become impossible because it could never depend on the truth of a thought whether a proper name had a reference. I think this is a very bad argument that an ideal language shouldn't possibly allow names uh, that don't have a reference. I can see what he's trying to do, but it's not clear that forcing every phrase to have a referent would actually fix the problem because the way he does it is by stipulating some strange object, some random object, the number zero to be the referent of the phrase. But uh, uh, we'd still be stuck with this question. Does this phrase denote what I think it denotes or does it denote the number zero? Okay, with the consideration of these noun clauses may be coupled that of types of adjective and adverbial clauses which are logically closely related to them. Adjective clauses also serve to construct compound proper names, even if unlike noun clauses, they are not sufficient by themselves for this purpose. These adjective clauses are to be regarded as equivalent to adjectives. Instead of the square root of four, which is smaller than zero, we have this relative clause, which is smaller than zero. He says, we can also say the negative square root of four. So which is smaller than zero somehow means the same thing as negative. 
we have here the case of a compound proper name constructed from the predicate expression with the help of the singular definite article. This is at any rate permissible if the predicate applies to one and only one single object. In accordance with what we said above, an expression of the kind in question must actually always be assured of a referent by means of a special stipulation, e.g. by the convention that zero shall count as referent when the predicate applies to no object or to more than one. Predicate expressions can be so constructed that characteristics are given by adjective clauses as in our example by the clause, which is smaller than zero. It is evident that such an adjective clause cannot have a thought as sense or a truth value as referent any more than the noun clause could. Its sense, which can also be expressed in many cases by a single adjective, is only a part of a thought. Here, as in the case of the noun clause, there is no independent subject and therefore no possibility of reproducing the sense of the subordinate clause in an independent sentence. Places, instants, stretches of time are logically considered objects. Hence, the linguistic designation of a definite place, a definite instance, or a stretch of time is to be regarded as a proper name. That is, names like Tuesday or 3.45 p.m. Those are nouns. They refer to an object, a place, or a time. Now, adverbial clauses of place and time can be used for the construction of such a proper name in a manner similar to that which we have seen in the case of noun and adjective clauses. In the same way, predicate expressions containing reference to places, etc., can be constructed. It is to be noted here also that the sense of these subordinate clauses cannot be reproduced in an independent sentence, since an essential component, namely the determination of place or time, is missing and is only indicated by a relative pronoun or a conjunction. In the case of these sentences, various interpretations are easily possible. The sense of the sentence. After Schleswig-Holstein was separated from Denmark, Prussia and Austria quarreled, can also be rendered in the form. After the separation of Schleswig-Holstein from Denmark, Prussia and Austria quarreled. That is, in one of these cases, we have a sentence, in the other, we have a noun. Schleswig-Holstein was separated versus the separation of Schleswig-Holstein. In this version, it is surely sufficiently clear that the sense is not to be taken as having as a part the thought that Schleswig-Holstein was once separated from Denmark, but that this is the necessary presupposition in order for the expression after the separation of Schleswig-Holstein from Denmark to have any referent at all. To be sure, our sentence can also be interpreted as saying that Schleswig, as saying that Schleswig-Holstein was once separated from Denmark. We then have a case which is to be considered later. In order to understand the difference more clearly, let us project ourselves into the mind of a Chinese who having little knowledge of European history, believes it to be false that Schleswig-Holstein was ever separated from Denmark. He might also have considered a 21st century American who probably has not so great a, uh, an impression of recent European politics as he did in 1892. He will take our sentence in the first version to be neither true nor false, but will deny it to have any reference on the ground of absence of reference for its subordinate clause. This clause would only apparently determine a time. If he interpreted our sentence in the second way, however, he would find a thought expressed in it, which he would take to be false, beside a part which would be without reference for him. So that is in these adverbial clauses, he says this sentence, after Schleswig-Holstein was separated from Denmark, Prussia and Austria quarreled. We could either think this says two things. First, it says that Schleswig-Holstein was separated from Germany. And second, it uses that to establish a time in which the se th second thing it says holds. Or he says it could just express that second part. Either way, that first part is somehow being used to designate a time, presumably somehow through a sense of these expressions, but how exactly is unclear. And Frege is doing a lot of attempts here. A lot of it is messy and confusing. It's only decades later that linguists came up with a better account of what is going on here. It's based on what Frege does, but it's not at all the same thing. In conditional clauses also, there may usually be recognized to occur an indefinite indicator having a similar correlate in the dependent clause. We've already seen this occur in noun, adjective, and adverbial clauses. Insofar as each indicator refers to the other, both clauses together form a connected whole which as a rule expresses only a single thought. In the sentence, if a number is less than one and greater than zero, 
its square is less than one and greater than zero. The component in question is a number in the conditional clause and its in the dependent clause. It is by means of this very indefiniteness that the sense acquires the generality expected of a law. It is this which is responsible for the fact that the antecedent clause alone has no complete thought as its sense, and in combination with the consequent clause expresses one and only one thought, whose parts are no longer thoughts. It is in general incorrect to say that in the hypothetical judgment, two judgments are put in a reciprocal relationship. If this or something similar is said, the word judgment is used in the same sense as I've connected with the word thought, so that I would use the formulation, a hypothetical thought establishes a reciprocal relationship between two thoughts. Uh, uh, this could be true only if an indefinite indicator is absent, but in such a case, there would also be no generality. So that is, he's saying a judgment is when you consider a thought and think it's true or consider the thought and think it's false. But in this case, if a number is less than one and greater than zero, its square is less than one and greater than zero. I'm not saying it's true or false that this number is less than one and greater than zero. I'm just saying if it is, then its square is also. And so he's saying it's not a relationship between two judgments. It's a relationship between two thoughts. And then I judge that thought to be true or I could judge that thought to be false, but the judgment is a further thing. The thought is what is expressed by the sentence. The thought is what is expressed by the clauses. A conditional relationship is a relationship between two thoughts. If an instant of time is to be indefinitely indicated in both conditional and dependent clauses, this is often achieved merely by using the present tense of the verb, which in such a case, however, does not indicate the temporal present. Uh, that is here, we had that sentence. If a number is less than one greater than zero, its square is less than one greater than zero. We're not saying that that number is now anything. It's not about now, it's about the, the time in those two parts being the same. This grammatical form is then the indicate, indefinite indicator in the main and subordinate clauses. An example of this is, when the sun is in the Tropic of Cancer, the longest day in the Northern Hemisphere occurs. I wish that was referring to the present moment, but it's not. It's just, there is some moment when the sun is in the Tropic of Cancer, that'll be in June, uh, and that'll be the longest day in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, using the present tense, but not denoting the present. This might be different in other languages. Here also, it is impossible to express the sense of the subordinate clause in a full sentence, because this sense is not a complete thought. If we say the sun is in the Tropic of Cancer, this would refer to our present time and thereby change the sense. The sun is in the Tropic of Cancer is something that is either true or false, but in this other sentence, it was denoting a time. Just as little as the sense of the main clause of thought, only the whole composed of main and subordinate clauses is such. It may be added that several common components in the antecedent and consequent clauses may be indefinitely indicated. Several common components, that is, there might be a time that's referenced in both, it might be a number that's referenced in both, it may be many things that are referenced in both. So a classic example that uh, uh, linguists use is the sentence, if a farmer owns a donkey, then he feeds it. The farmer and the donkey are in the antecedent and the farmer and the donkey are also in the consequent. And we don't know which farmer, which donkey. This is not about any particular farmer or donkey. It's a general condition. It is clear that noun clauses with who or what and adverbial clauses with where, when, whenever, wherever are often to be interpreted as having the sense of conditional clauses, e.g. who touches pitch defiles himself. Anyone who touches pitch defiles himself. Adjective clauses can also take the place of conditional clauses. Thus, the sense of the sentence previously used can be given in the form, the square of a number which is less than one and greater than zero is less than one and greater than zero. The situation is quite different if the comp common component of the two clauses is designated by a proper name. In the sentence, Napoleon, who recognized the danger to his right flank, himself led his guards against the enemy position. Two thoughts are expressed. Napoleon recognized the danger to his right flank. Napoleon himself led his guards against the enemy position. 
The distinction he's talking about here is one that modern grammarians call the distinction between re uh, restrictive and non-restrictive uh, relative clauses. In this case, it's a non-restrictive clause because who recognized the danger to his right flank is not restricting who we're talking about by Napoleon. It's saying another thing about him. Whereas if I said, the person who, who recognized the danger to his right flank himself led his guards against the enemy position, that's a restrictive relative clause because it's not just any old person, it's the person who recognized the danger to his right flank. However, if I had already established what person I was talking about, I could use a non-restrictive relative clause by putting a comma. That person, the person who recognized the danger to his right flank, himself led his guards against the enemy position. He's noting these restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses work differently. When and where this has happened, this happened is to be fixed only by the context, but it is nevertheless to be taken as definitely determined thereby. If the entire sentence is uttered as an assertion, we thereby simultaneously assert both component sentences. If one of the parts is false, the whole is false. Here we have the case that the subordinate clause by itself has a complete thought as sense, if we complete it by indication of place and time. The referent of the subordinate clause is accordingly a truth value. We can therefore expect that it may be replaced without harm to the truth value of the whole by a sentence having the same truth value. This is indeed the case, but it is to be noticed that for purely grammatical reasons, its subject must be Napoleon. For only then can it be brought into the form of an adjective clause belonging to Napoleon. But if the demand that it be expressed in this form be waived and the connection be shown by and, this restriction disappears. So that is up until this point, most of the subordinate clauses he's talked about have been indirect in some way or another. They have referred to their senses. But this is one where he says it's direct. It refers to its referent. So that is, he's saying, Napoleon, uh, who recognized the danger to his right flank, himself led his guards against the enemy position. That sentence would be still true if I replaced that clause with anything else that's true about Napoleon. Napoleon, who was born on Corsica, himself led his guards against the enemy position. Napoleon, who died in exile on Elba, himself led his guards against the enemy position. As opposed to the person in the restrictive clause, the person who recognized the dangers to his right flank himself led his guards against the enemy position, doesn't mean the same thing as the person who was born on Corsica himself led his guards against the enemy position. In the restrictive clauses, uh, this ha is indirect. In the non-restrictive clauses, it is direct. Subsidiary clauses beginning with although also express complete thoughts. This conjunction actually has no sense and does not change the sense of the clause, but only illuminates it in a particular fashion, similar in the cases of but and yet. This is something that Grice might have more to say. We could indeed replace the conditional clause without harm to the truth value of the whole by another of the same truth value, but the light in which the clause is placed by the conjunction might then easily appear unsuitable, as if a song with a sad subject were to be sung in a lively fashion. So that is, uh, we might say, although it is cold outside, it will be warm in a few months. It would be odd to say, although two plus two is four, it will be warm again in a few months. He's saying, although just means the same as and. The sentence is still true. It's just weird to say although when the two parts aren't connected to each other. He says that although, but, yet, these are just saying the same thing as and, but then giving different conceptions in our head. In the last cases, the truth of the whole included the truth of the component clauses. The case is different if a conditional clause expresses a complete thought by containing, in place of an indefinite indicator, a proper name or something which is to be regarded as equivalent. In the sentence, if the sun has already risen, the sky is very cloudy. The time is the present, that is to say, definite. And the place is also to be thought of as definite. That is, if we're imagining, sit, we're sitting here, it's, it's pretty dark, I haven't looked outside yet. And so I'm saying, if the sun has already risen, the sky is very cloudy. We're talking about the present moment. 
Here, it can be said that a relation between the truth values of conditional and dependent clauses has been asserted, namely such that the case does not occur in which the antecedent clause refers to the true and the consequent to the false. Accordingly, I sentence is true when the sun has not yet risen, whether the sky is very cloudy or not, and also when the sun has risen and the sky is very cloudy. Here he's explaining the truth table for the conditional, for those of you that have taken a logic class. Since only truth values are here in question, each component clause can be replaced by another of the same truth value without changing the truth value of the whole. This is something a lot of people find very questionable when they're learning the truth table for the conditional in a logic class. To be sure, the light in which the subject then appears would usually be unsuitable. The thought would easily seem distorted, but this has nothing to do with its truth value. One must always take care not to clash with the subsidiary thoughts, which are, however, not explicitly expressed and therefore should not be reckoned in the sense. Hence, also, no account need be taken of their truth values. The thought of our sentence might also be expressed thus, either the sun has not yet risen or the sky is very cloudy, which shows how this kind of sentence connection is to be understood. The simple cases have now been discussed. <laughs> Let us review what we have learned. The subordinate clause usually has for its sense not a thought, but only a part of one, and consequently no truth value is referent. The reason for this is either that the words in the subordinate clause have indirect referent, so that the referent, not the sense of the subordinate clause is a thought, or else that on account of the presence of an indefinite indicator, the subordinate clause is incomplete and expresses a thought only when combined with the main clause. It may happen, however, that the sense of a subsidiary clause is a complete thought, in which case it can be replaced by another of the same truth value without harm to the truth of the whole, provided there are no grammatical obstacles. An examination of all the subordinate clauses which one may encounter will soon provide some which do not fit well into these categories. The reason, so far as I can see, is that these subordinate clauses have no such simple sense. Almost always, it seems, we connect with the main thoughts expressed by us, subsidiary thoughts which, although not expressed, are associated by our words in accordance with psychological laws by the hearer. And since the subsidiary thought appears to be connected with our words of its own accord, almost like the main thought itself, we want it also to be expressed. The sense of the sentence is thereby enriched, and it may well happen that we have more simple thoughts than clauses. In many cases, the sentence must be understood in this way. In others, it may be doubtful whether the subsidiary thought belongs to the sense of the sentence or only accompanies it. This may be important for the question whether an assertion is a lie or an oath is a perjury. One might perhaps find that the sentence, Napoleon, who recognized the danger to his right flank, himself led his guards against the enemy position, expresses not only the two thoughts shown above, but also the thought that the knowledge of the danger was the reason why he led the guards against the enemy position. One may in fact doubt whether this thought is merely lightly suggested or really expressed. Let the question be considered whether our sentence be false if Napoleon's decision had already been made before he recognized the danger. If our sentence could be true in spite of this, then the subsidiary thought should not be understood as part of the sense. One would probably decide in favor of this. The alternative would make for a quite complicated situation. We would have more simple thoughts than clauses. If the sentence, Napoleon recognized the danger to his right flank, were now to be replaced by another having the same truth value, e.g. Napoleon was already more than 45 years old. Not only would our first thought be changed, but also our third one. Hence, the truth value of the latter might change, namely if his age was not the reason for the decision to lead the guards against the enemy. This shows why clauses of equal truth value cannot always be substituted for one another in such cases. The clause expresses more through its connection with another than it does in isolation. Okay, this is really complicated. He's saying, go back to that sentence. Uh, Napoleon, who recognized the danger to his right flank, himself led his guards against the enemy position. Frege thinks what the sentence says is just two things. Napoleon recognized the danger to his right flank and Napoleon himself led his guards against the enemy position. But he says, someone might claim there's actually three things this sentence says. Napoleon recognized the danger to his right flank. Napoleon led his guards against the enemy position. And because Napoleon recognized the danger to his right flank, Napoleon led his guards against the enemy position. I think Frege thinks that third thing is not stated, 
it is just implied, it is just associated, it is just pragmatically conveyed by a Gricean implicature, perhaps. Frege, of course, had never heard of Grice because Grice hadn't been born at the time that Frege was writing. But uh, uh, he says, if you think that, then the sentence has three thoughts, and then it's not okay to just replace that uh, subordinate clause by another one with the same truth value. The, there would be two clauses in which these things have their customary referent, and so the truth value is all that matters. But in the third clause, the because clause that links them, it has to have its indirect sense. Uh, so this shows why clauses of equal truth value cannot always be substituted for one another in such cases. The clause expresses more through its connection with another than it does in isolation. Let us now consider cases where this regularly happens. In the sentence, Babel mistakenly supposes that the return of Alsace-Lorraine would appease France's desire for revenge. Two thoughts are expressed, which are not, however, shown by means of antecedent consequent clauses. That is, one, Babel believes that the return of Alsace-Lorraine would appease France's desire for revenge. Two, the return of Alsace-Lorraine would not appease France's desire for revenge. In the expression of the first thought, the words of the subordinate clause have their indirect reference. We're talking about what Babel believes. While the same words have their customary reference in the expression of the second thought. In saying that Babel believes it falsely, we are denying something about Alsace-Lorraine in France. This shows that the subordinate clause in our original complex sentence is to be taken twice over with different reference, of which one is a thought, the other a truth value. Since the truth value is not the whole referent of the subordinate clause, we cannot simply replace the latter by another of equal truth value. Similar considerations apply to expressions such as no, discover, it is known that. These are expressions that linguists now call factive. They both express a thought and also say that the thought is true. By means of a subordinate clause of reason and the associated main clause, we express several thoughts which, however, do not correspond separately to the original clauses. In the sentence, because ice is less dense than water, it floats on water. We have one, ice is less dense than water. Two, if anything is less dense than water, then it floats on water. Three, ice floats on water. The third thought, however, need not be explicitly introduced since it is contained in the remaining two. On the other hand, Neither the first and third nor the second and third combined would furnish the sense of our sentence. It can now be seen that our subordinate clause, because ice is less dense than water, expresses our first thought as well as a part of our second. This is how it comes to pass that our subsidiary clause cannot be simply replaced by another of equal truth value, for this would alter our second thought and thereby easily alter its truth value. The situation is similar in the sentence. If iron were less dense than water, it would float on water. Here we have the two thoughts that iron is not less dense than water and that something floats on water if it is less dense than water. The subsidiary clause again expresses one thought and a part of the other. If we interpret the sentence already considered, after Schleswig-Holstein was separated from Denmark, Prussia and Austria quarreled in such a way that it expresses the thought that Schleswig-Holstein was once separated from Denmark, we have first this thought, Secondly, the thought that at a time more closely determined by the subordinate clause Prussia and Austria quarreled. Here also, the subordinate clause expresses not only one thought, but also a part of the other. Therefore, it may not in general be replaced by another of the same truth value. It is hard to exhaust all the possibilities given by language, but I hope to have brought to light at least the essential reasons why a subordinate clause may not always be replaced by another of equal truth value without harm to the truth of the whole sentence structure. These reasons arise. One, when the subordinate clause does not refer to a truth value inasmuch as it only expresses part of a thought. Two, when the subordinate clause does refer to a truth value but is not restricted to doing so inasmuch as its sense includes one thought and part of another. The first case arises A, an indefinite reference of words, B, if a part of the sentence is only an indefinite indicator instead of a proper name. In the second case, the subsidiary clause may have to be taken twice over. That is once in its customary reference 
and the other time an indirect reference. Or the sense of a part of the subordinate clause may likewise be a component of another thought, which taken together with the thought directly expressed by the subordinate clause makes up the sense of the whole sentence. It follows with sufficient probability from the foregoing that the cases where a subordinate clause is not replaceable by another of the same value cannot be brought in disproof of our view that a truth value is the referent of a sentence having a thought as its sense. Let us return to our starting point. If we found A as A and A as B to have different cognitive values, the explanation is that for the purpose of knowledge, the sense of the sentence, viz. the thought expressed by it, is no less referent than it, less relevant than its referent, i.e. its truth value. If now A is B, then indeed the referent of B is the same as that of A, and hence the truth value of A as B is the same as that of A as A. In spite of this, the sense of B may differ from that of A, and thereby the sense expressed in A as B differs from that of A as A. In that case, the two sentences do not have the same cognitive value. If we understand by judgment the advance from the thought to its truth value, as in the above paper, we can also say that the judgments are different. Okay, so that's the conclusion. And hopefully, as you see, the first half has the clearer arguments about what is sense, what is reference, and uh, how they differ from ideas in our heads. The sense is this publicly shared meaning. The referent is an object itself. And the second half is all about dealing with various structures of sentences in which there are subordinate sentences trying to show that the fact that subordinate sentences sometimes refer to their sense isn't a counterexample to his overall theory. But the main point is there's these two components of meaning. Meaning of a whole is determined by meaning of a part. The sense of the whole is determined by the sense of a part. The referent of the whole is determined by the reference of the part. The sense of a sentence is a thought, the proposition that's expressed, the referent of a sentence is the truth value, whether or not the objects involved actually stand in relation to each other as said. Okay, that's it.